Can you fly this plane and land it? Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. What we've got here is failure to communicate. We got one! Hello, Patreon. We're back. It's me, Kevin. And of course, I'm joined by... Will. <laughs> I think you forget that I'm teeing you up and that you're expecting me to say your name. I think I'm listening to the podcast and I'm just kind of going, oh, what's what's this episode about? <laughs> That's my problem. I'm just, I'm just a passenger. Well, look, we should actually tell people because we're going to release this episode on the main feed a couple of days after it's on our Patreon. And for everyone who's been listening to the main show, they're not really aware of what this show actually is about. Mm-hmm. So... I guess the way to describe it is that on Patreon, we've been putting out our audio commentaries, but we've also been doing these mini episodes, which are like 20 minute one shot episodes. We talk about what we've been watching that week. We've, we've done, this is our seventh one. Mm -hmm. So we're doing them quite regularly. Film and TV. Uh, Yeah. Film and TV. But for this episode, we're going to do what we're watching all year or really in my case, what I've been watching (laughs) over Christmas to sort of, prepare myself to be able to say what I should have been watching over the last year. So it's our kind of best films that we've seen so far this year list, isn't that it? But not the best of the year list. Yes, I would say favourites. Yeah. And that's it. We're not film critics. We've not seen 400 films this year. I mean, Will, you've seen a lot more than I have. Mm. Not but, not 400, not, yeah. not not on the film critic level where they have to see everything. I know I, I, I've seen I've seen more than I normally see at this time of the year. I've seen more films released in 2021 than um, than I ever have seen films released in the year in which I'm, you know, doing a list in. So um, this is, yeah, this is good. I'm, I'm glad we're doing this. I would say two things. One, I'm glad I'm not a film critic because this has been really taxing <laughs> to watch so many films the last few weeks. And really, look, we need to have an intervention. Filmmakers, you need to stop making two hour plus films. It's just, you don't need it. <laughs> yeah. I'm seriously, I've had enough of it. And the other thing I want to say is, um, what did you think of this year, Will, in terms of the quality of films? Was it a good year for movies? I honestly, I'm ending up with with the exact same opinion as I have most here, is that, yeah, the stuff I've, I've seen a, a, a few great films and I've seen a lot of mediocre films and I've seen a few bad films, really bad films. And that's generally what I say about every year. There's like maybe about five or six fantastic films that I see in a year and the rest are pretty good, you know? So I think it's on par, honestly. Hmm. Okay. What about you? I would say it's been a so-so year. There's been, a, for my taste, there's been a lot of stuff that has disappointed me. Nothing is something that I think I'm going to be coming back to in five years' time and watching again and again and again. I think you're is that harsh. At, it's harsh, and you're looking at the past with rose-tinted glasses. You're well, kind of fuck forgetting. It. <laughs> you're forgetting about all those all those films you saw in between those amazing films. You know, so there's a lot of like you know, ah, that was grand. You know, but maybe in time, you know, your opinion might grow over some of those. Uh, it was grand films. But how are we going to do it, Kevin? Do you want to do, what are we going to do next? Do you want to do um, uh, our kind of best bits? This year, I have watched a ton of films for the podcast. And so I was really curious, what have you seen, thanks to doing this podcast, that you discovered in 2021 that you loved film-wise? Oh, can I, well, I can give you my, my top five. Do you want me to do that one? I can rattle them off really quickly. Go for it. It's better than okay. the top 10. <laughs> Better than top 10. Okay, uh, my fifth favourite film that I discovered, so these are first watches because of the podcast, um, yep. was S- Stone Cold, which I don't know. Am I am I uh, spoiling things with that one? Stone Cold was this action um, movie. Should I say that one? <laughs> You've said it, no, fuck it, it's out there. It's in there, it's, right. um, it's It's coming out in a couple of weeks. It's a mystery film that we watched. We did a first viewing for the podcast where we watched a film that I'd never seen before, you'd never seen before, and our special mm-hmm. guest on that episode, Pierce, had never seen before. And uh, it was a laugh. And I forgot about that film. I loved it as well. <laughs> yeah, it was great fun. It was bloody great fun. Um, uh, the fourth favourite one was uh, The Great Muppet Caper from our uh, Muppet episode. Oh, yes. A delight, an absolute delight. My third favourite one, which I'd never seen before, was The Big Sleep, the Howard... Um, the Humphrey Bogart, uh, Lauren Bacall film from the 40s, which I really enjoyed. And my second favourite was the original Miracle on the 34th Street, which I loved and now has become a uh, a yearly uh, watch for me around Christmas. And my favourite film that I watched for the first time because of the podcast and my favourite film that I watched in, t- in, 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 you know, complete, you know, on any list this past year, including films that came oh. out in 2021, 
is uh, for the World War II episode, the film Come and See, which absolutely... Oh, yes, that was a first time viewing for you. That was a first time viewing and it was an astounding film. It was uh, yeah. just devastating, uh, so, so horrific. It's astonishing, yeah. Astonishing, beautiful and horrific and it uh, blew me away. I don't know if I ever will watch it again, but maybe I will. I kind of, I think maybe I will. So th- th- those are my kind of five favourite discoveries because of the podcast. What about you? Um, I had the Great Muppet Caper on there as well, funnily enough, because I uh, went back and I basically discovered a whole new appreciation and love for the Muppets. And God, you know, it's on that episode. They broke me and I love the Muppets, the OG Muppets. So that was definitely one of my five. The other one that I loved came from the Whodunits episode as well. The one that we did with C. Robert Cargill, but it was Laura, the Otter Preminger. <gasps> oh, I still haven't seen that. I want to see that. It is my favourite Whodunit and it has everything that I think a great Whodunit has. And I would definitely recommend that people check that out from 1944. The Gene Turney film. It's great. Yeah. Um, also Mikey and Nikki, which was recommended by Pierce Ryan to us um, on the One Night in the Big City uh, uh, topic. Elaine May. Yeah, Elaine May. Didn't Elaine, did Elaine May write that? She did. She wrote and directed it. Oh, she directed it as was, well, yeah. Yeah, it was maligned at the time and it was fantastic. It's definitely one to make some time for and to watch and you will be swept away by one of the great movies from the 70s that you probably never heard of, uh, at least in my case it didn't. Mm. The other one was another recommendation from Pierce Wayne and it was Streetwise. It was the documentary from uh, 1984. <gasps> Yeah. Um, that really got under my skin and uh, tore my heart out. I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was such a raw, uh, fascinating documentary and it's really special. And I guess one more would be uh, Victoria, which was the uh, the one from the single, single take. take episode. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's set in Berlin. I think it came out about 10 years ago. It's all one take. It is a blast. And really, not more I can say. Other than I think that was those more are recent discoveries. I think that was more recent than 10 years ago, actually. It's probably only in the last five years, maybe, or something like that. Um, yeah, all and a lot of those films are still on my watch list, Kevin. And I've seen clips from them because I was editing those episodes and they look fantastic. Mikey and Nikki, Stri- that clip from Streetwise broke me and I haven't seen the bloody film. Um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot of, still also, a lot of great films life, on my watch list. Afterlife, I mentioned that on the monologues episode <clears throat> and it is beautiful and it's from 1998. It's a Japanese film and it will always stay with me, that film. But it's it's a tough one to wow. recommend because you're asking people to sit down and just watch a, a bunch of um, recently deceased people sort of summarise their life and pick their favourite memory, their favourite moment from when they were happiest to become the representation of the afterlife for them and seeing characters reconcile that, uh, decide what is the moment where they were happiest and it's so beautiful and humane and understated and gorgeous. So yeah. Wonderful. Those are my five. (laughs) Great. And so now best films or favorites from the year. The way we are going to structure it is that we're, I think I've heard it done in a couple other podcasts and um, uh, shows, and I think it's actually quite good. We're going to go uh, number 10. We're going to count down from the top. We'll, we'll do my 10 and Kevin's 10. And if we have an overlap, we'll put, we'll kind of like freeze discussing it until we reach the higher ranking. And you'll understand because I'm sure we'll overlap on a few films. Uh, do you want to go first or will I go first? Your number 10 pick. I don't mind. All right, I'll go first. You can go first, Kevin. Go on. My number 10 was Matrix Resurrections. <laughs> I'm surprised. I'm surprised. No, it wasn't. Okay, no. go on. <laughs> My number 10 is a film that I just watched only a few days ago. Oh. And I stress tested my list with a few friends. And this is the one that almost got me kicked out of the friends group. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> it is a disgusting film by many people's accounts. And I think they're wrong on that. I think it's a misread. It is uh, Silent Night. It's directed by Camille Griffin. It's written and directed by her. It stars Kira Knightley. Okay. And for me to to sum up the film would change the way that I experienced the film, which is that Dan Martin, a friend of the pod, who's on next week's episode on Terminator 2, the commentary for that, Mm -hmm. he said this is one of his favourite films of the year. And even he put it on his 10... Uh, favorite films on his podcast, the Arrow Video Podcast uh, with Sam Ashurst. 
I decided to give it a go because of that. I knew nothing about it. I didn't know what to expect. I thought a Christmas film with Kira Knightley is giving me Love Actually flashbacks, but I'll give it a go. It was 90 minutes long, so already I loved it. And <laughs> it just kept unfurling in a way that I did not expect. I thought it was acerbic, satirical. It was a farce. And then it started to get darker and darker and darker. And it got to a point in the story towards the end. And I have to say, I loved this film, genuinely loved it. And I would have put it a lot higher on my list, except that it was so polarizing. There's a moment at the very end, there's a shot that ends the film before it cuts to credits Mm -hmm. that I thought, ooh, oh, I'm not sure about that. That's going to be misread by people. Some of my friends did read it in a different interpretation because of where we are in the world right now with COVID. But when I did a little bit of research into the background of the film, and this was a film that was made pre-COVID yeah. and took a while to, to get released, it's more of an allegory for climate change and for the Brexit debacle than it is anything to do with the pandemic. But if you view it with uh, the pandemic at the front of your mind, which is going to be hard for a lot of people to put that aside. But if you do view it that way, you might have a very different reading on the film and you might end up despising the politics of the film. But how it ends, uh, the characters that we focus on really hit home the point that this is about the ramifications of choices that are made by people who are the high society folk and those who should know better and they're not doing the right thing. So it's a Brexit allegory and it's a climate change allegory. I thought it was very entertaining, very surprising, and I would highly recommend watching Silent Night. Wow. And and that's one I was (laughs) truly going to skip because that only came out in cinemas in the last month. And it was so derided by critics that I, you know, listen to or read or whatever, that I went, ah, yeah, I'm never going to watch this. But n- you're the first person to 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 give it a, a positive recommendation. So now I'm incredibly curious. So, uh, yeah, I might slip that on my watch I'm the second list. because Dan was the first. Dan was the one to convince me. And I'm so glad he did because I really enjoyed the film. Oh. I think it's a cracker. Okay, cool. Well, my number 10 I had to squeeze in an animated film uh, somewhere uh, in this list. And it is one that probably people have not heard of. It's a Japanese animated film called Bell, B-E-L-L-E. And it's uh, made by mm. Mamoru Hosada. And uh, Mamoru, he's he's written, written and directed the film. He made films like uh, Wolf, The Wolf Children, The Girl Who Leapt Through Time, The Boy and the Beast. Um, probably films you've never heard of before. But he he's a really humanist approach to his stories. And it's a kind of a riff on The Beauty and the Beast, but set in a kind of a social media metaverse. Uh, it's gorgeously animated. It has musical elements. And it has songs that have uh, importance and meaning, and they're gorgeous songs. And there's the char- I I cared for the characters. It looked wonderful. I was swept along with the story, and ultimately, I I found it actually more powerful than the the tale of Beauty and the Beast because there's a kind of a uh, the 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 Beauty and the Beast narrative happens in the kind of metaverse but then there's a real world story where people are living in the normal world like us and and um that element of the story actually really i found very very compelling and had a very satisfying con- conclusion so i will highly recommend bell i think is one of the best animated films of the year now there's others out there but this one is the one that affected me the most so there you go that's my number 10 fair enough mm-hmm. Is is it a family film or a young adult film? Yeah, like, well, who would you recommend that to? I'd recommend it to all all the family. It might be a little bit too mature for anyone under maybe maybe under eight, you know. But I think anyone could watch it. I think it's a for all ages type of film, and um, yeah, it's there we it's go. really good. Bell, Bell, yeah, it's we've lovely. not overlapped so far. No, um, what's your number nine? So my number, my number nine is Pig. <gasps> oh, good, right. Great, great, great. I am suspecting that this is on your list, is it? No, it's not. No, no, no. Oh, there we go. But I, it's not. I only watched great. this. It's, I, I, I really enjoyed this film. Go on. Yeah, so Pig was another one. Look, the, the thing that I loved about catching up with so many films uh, this year particularly is that there has been such a glut of new releases that I've not been able to even keep up with the marketing or the promotion for any of these films. So I'm watching them as cold as cold can be where I don't know what genre they are. I don't know who's in it. I just know this film is called Pig and it stars Nicolas Cage yeah. and it's worth watching. I sit down to watch and I think this is going to be, okay, it's going to be, you know, 
standard for the last couple of years with, with Nicolas Cage, where he's unhinged and uh, giving uh, a larger than life performance. And maybe this is going to be almost a parody uh, upon his own persona, as well as the, the genre that he's in. It was nothing like that. It was a very tender film that took me entirely by surprise. It's quite sparse, but it doesn't feel underwritten. And it really is a film about male characters dealing with grief. Uh, I didn't expect where it went. It brought me to tears towards the end. Mm. And Nicolas Cage is really restrained in it. And there is a, there's a moment in it where he gives a monologue and he's quite sort of a, a taciturn character, but he gives a monologue in it that is excoriating. He, he, he says to a character, you are basically a fake person. Nothing you do or say matters and none of these people matter. It's delivered so tenderly, but forcefully. It's very slight, but again, it's a 90 minute film. I would highly recommend it. It's pig. It's in my honourable mentions. And I was, I had a very similar experience to it as you did that I, because I'm just watching these films. I don't look at any trailers. I'm just getting through them. And uh, I was, I was like you, I was totally surprised because I didn't know what, what I was what this film was and I was expecting it to go a John Wick way and it doesn't go that way uh, even though it almost knocks on the door and that scene is an amazing scene <laughs> that scene's an amazing amazing scene uh, yeah I too found it to be a really touching little film and it's in my honourable mentions so um, yeah I'd recommend that one too definitely uh, my number nine Superb. my number nine is I wanted to because I've enjoyed documentaries this year um, and I'm still, I have a load to catch up on, but, but I felt like I needed to get a documentary in there. And I put in one that is fairly conventional. Um, and it, I know I watched this in the last few days and it's called The Rescue. And it's a documentary about the 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 saving. Don't know it. Well, you, you, you'll you know what it's based on. It's remember that Thai soccer team that got trapped in a cave in Thailand in, you know, oh God, yeah, for yeah, a few yeah. weeks. Um, it's about that. And it is a gripping. It's like watching, uh, a, you know, a Hollywood disaster movie, a Poseidon adventure or, or daylight, you know, that sort of only this is real. Yeah. And because it was covered uh, in a, on a global scale, there's there's camera footage of every angle of this entire thing. And you basically are experiencing the story through the, the through the guys who were at the spearhead of the rescue attempt. Just regular Joes. Is Elon Musk in it? He's not in it, thank God. But it got, <laughs> but it, it, he he manifested in my memory of what he what he did or what he tweeted about during this event, and I got really angry at him because I went, "You asshole! Look at these guys. They are these were guys who were pulled. They were just regular guys who basically spearheaded this mission, who were like electricians, and but they have this hobby of cave diving. This really weird is it hobby? And is it um is it uh does it make your palms sweat? Yes, because. The idea, I went black water rafting once in New Zealand, which is sort of white water rafting, but it's in caves, so it's in darkness. And there were moments where you had to, you had to inch your way under a cave structure with your nose basically touching the, the, the top of the cave and you're floating. And I get flashbacks to that every so often and I get really, this is cold shivered on my back. So I'm sure that that film, that documentary would shit me up. Yes, it basically does capture that experience. There's some incredibly, uh, 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 what's the word, uh, claustrophobia-inducing uh, moments in mm. the film, and you realise the, the the how how difficult uh, a job it was to try and rescue these kids. But the 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 thing that really moved me about the film was kind of it kind of went down to the power, which this might might sound odd, but the power of prayer and the power power of communication. And these children, you know, the the operation depended on people coming together and focusing their attention on rescuing these kids. And it was only because- Didn't they have to rescue them- Don't spoil it. They couldn't. They couldn't. Don't say- People will want to watch it. I'm not going to spoil it. People might- It's based on the news well. People might have have forgotten. This happened like a few years ago. People might have forgotten about how it actually turned out because I'd forgotten the actual ins and outs of like how they did it at the end. Um- it's the crocodile sequence in there, the you know, cro- where they have yeah. to get past all the crocodiles. The Meg is there, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, the, and the pirate, oh. the ghost pirates were there too. Can't wait, <laughs> can't wait. <laughs> but I recommend, it's a very straight, straightforward, it's another, it's probably only 90 minutes long as well. So if you want a gripping, like, you know, Excellent. procedural, 
okay, how are we going to figure this out? That's what it is. It's like, okay, this is the job. How we, and we're bringing in a crew. We're bringing in, uh, like, what's got, early on, it's like, they have one guy and he's like, he's he's a cave diver. He knows this cave better than anyone. And he's and, and when they're trying to figure out how they're going to get in there, he, he writes on a napkin, these are the best cave divers in the world. Contact them now. So they pull in like these guys, these electricians from like, Australia and all that sort of stuff and they're all just flown there and they're they're just regular Joes making their own equipment and oh, I love it already yeah, it's great it is great gripping so that's my number nine Kevin what about you fantastic we're going to number eight okay my number eight is um, the power of the dog and it's on my it list the Jane Camp yes okay so we'll wait on your li- we'll oh, wait till we get we'll there wait. and we'll discuss it when it gets when when we reach my thingy so uh, will I tell you what's your number eight my number eight is oh Red Rocket is my number eight the film that's on my list okay okay so we'll move on to our number sevens okay so what's your <laughs> number seven number seven yeah move on to your number seven um, my number my number seven is The Nest. Oh. And I it is by uh, Sean Durkin. Are you furiously tapping away trying to Google? Uh, Sean Durkin is the guy that did Martha May, Marge, Margaret, Meryl, Mags, Marlene. Yeah. Or whatever that film was called. Yeah. Um, it is a slow burn unraveling of a family in the 80s. Jude Law and Carrie Coon are a couple. And they pick up sticks from their life in the States to go back to London. And what unfolds is one of the most riveting sort of coming apart of a a family in a beautifully precise, observed style. And how to describe it? It it feels to me like a film that Kubrick would like. Mm -hmm. And another way to describe it is that it's almost like a a haunted house movie, but where there are no ghosts in it, except the ghost of capitalism. Oh. Yeah, he is a restless bluffer who's on the make. He is a guy who pretends to be wealthy. And it really sums up that sort of neoliberalism 80s agenda. I'm, I, it's very, very good. When you started to describe it, I actually know I've seen clips from it and I went and I was I was very intrigued and I'm so glad you put it back on my radar because I'd forgotten about that film. And it's, um, yeah, I'm definitely going to watch it. Absolutely. Shall I tell you my number seven? I think that's where I am now. Number seven. Go for it. It is Coda. Is that on your list? It was on my list up until I saw Silent Night. Okay. And I bumped it. Uh, but I thought that film was gorgeous. The last, this came back onto my list at the last minute as I was just, I was just basically shuffling stuff around. I went, you know what? I really thought Coda was such a sweet warm lovely film that I really I didn't see anything else like it this year even though it was fairly conventional what Coda is mm. it's a film that's on Apple I think Apple released it um, Coda stands for uh, Children of Deaf Adults and it's a coming of age story about the daughter of uh, a family of you know of, of child, child of deaf adults um, played by Amelia Jones I believe her name is and she's her family the daughter of Alla Jones you know the the walking in the air no the, way the singer that did the snowman what she looks like him as well oh yeah that's wow his my mind is blown I didn't know that um but her parents have this fishing business and her fishing business is threatened but also she is an amazing singer but her parents have never heard her sing because they're deaf and so she has this gift isn't that a beautiful conflict to yeah. have in a story I believed every one of the characters' positions. I believed she's got a deaf brother as well. Mm-hmm. And the sort of the pressure that she's under to be an interpreter for a family. Yeah. Um, and the, f- the the mother says at one point to her, uh, when she says she's joined the choir, it's like, oh, okay, whatever. And she's like, why aren't you happy for me? She's like, "Would if I was blind, would you have decided to become a painter? It's like, it's creating this distance between her and her mother. Yeah. Her family. And I thought, oh, this is really beautiful. It's about letting go, letting her you know, fly. And there was an amazing, yeah, it's very sweet. There's an amazing scene between the parents as well. They're, they're signing to each other. When she's saying, I want to pursue this music thing. Her parents are, have a discussion like parents do. And they, they have this conversation. They, they ask each other the question, but what if she's not no good? You know, what if she can't sing? Because mm. they have no, they have no frame of reference. They just, they just, it's this blind faith they have to go on and they're doubting it and everything is reliant on her and it's just a wonderful dramatic structure and beautiful performances and the music is amazing. There were, there were about 
there were two or three moments in that which genuinely brought me to tears. One of them was when all the sound drops out. That's the um, one. That's a big moment. on stage. Yeah. And you get to see it from, <clears throat> I get it choked up from the family's perspective where it's complete silence and they're watching all the faces of everybody reacting to her and they cannot hear it. They, they can't, they can't connect to it. Yeah. They just know that she's happy and they're happy. The other one was when the dad, he, he, he asked her to sing for him mm-hmm. and she sings directly into his face and he's like feeling her throat. I thought that was really beautiful. And the last one was when she's doing the audition and she starts signing mm-hmm. and suddenly her heart opens up and she starts singing with passion. I thought, oh, this is this is so affecting and it, it's not manipulative. And it, it just felt like great coming of age film. They hit all the beats that you want. And yeah, I bumped it for Silent Night, S- Silent Night which is probably more even unforgivable now. But uh, it's a beautiful film and yeah. definitely in my honourable mentions. And I'll credit the um, the writer-director, um, is it Cyan Header is her name, I believe it is. So, no, Sean Header. Is it Sean as I pronounce her name? Okay, it's written really yeah, weird. It's, it's just, um, and she's she's only done it's a It's the Welsh, pr- uh, Welsh spelling. Really? I've I've never known that. I didn't know that. But uh, if, you, yeah. if I was to give you a comparison, if we were in the Extra Vision, if you were coming to me at Extra Vision with this, I would say if you want an uplifting, definitely it's definitely a tearjerker, but in a good way, this is the film... You know, you know, for you to watch, I I highly recommend it. I think it's a uh, an all round, um, you know, everyone people pleaser. I think this film is and should be get I suppose more attention when it comes to awards and stuff like that. So that's my. It number should seven. if this had come out in the mid two thousands, it would have uh, opened in cinemas and it would have become a film that was in heavy rotation for a generation of girls. I think mm-hmm. um, because it's a really strong female lead to use a tire trope. But she's great. She's brilliant. And uh, I really, yeah, I, I loved it. My number five. Number six. And I really. Number oh, no, my, was my number six The Nest? Oh, was that number six? No, I thought. So. Uh, oh, was that number? I think that was number seven because I did my number. I just did my number seven. So yeah, I need your number six. Okay. Then my number six is Spider Man No Way Home. Hey, hey, good man. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Look. I really debated about putting this on here because what am I doing here? Am I recommending films that people might not have heard of? Uh, No. But am I recommending films that people might not give a chance to uh, because of the bias that's built up over the last 10 years towards Marvel and over the last couple of years towards Disney? Um, For me, this film was a lot better than I had any right being. Uh, It's the 11th appearance of Spider-Man on the big screen and it's the 27th MCU movie and for it to be this good this fun this entertaining this daring this clever um, it really took me by surprise and when I was trying to look at what was my favourite blockbuster major big blockbuster of the year there was no comparison I preferred it to every other big heavy hitter this year preferred it to um, Bond preferred it to Dune preferred it to uh what else? I can't even remember. Uh, so it was the most fun that I had watching a big major tempo film. And what more can I say? It's a way better Marvel film than you think it is. And I think you'll enjoy it. So give it a go. I'm I'm with you there. I spent a lot of the first hour thinking, oh, this is, they're not going to pull this off. And I spent most of the last hour going, they pulled this off. They actually pulled this off. <laughs> I went, I started off as a complete doubter and cynic and ended up feeling similar to you, Kevin, going, oh no, this was a, a joyful execution. My number, my number six is a film that you just mentioned. I'm going to, uh, in another big blockbuster spectacle, I'm going for No Time to Die, the last of the Daniel Craig films. You're joking yeah, me. Yeah, I know, I really You're am. You're absolutely joking I'm not joking, joking you. Kevin, yeah, I, my, oh my I, 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 I'm doing this. That wouldn't be heart. in my top 25 that's of the year. That's not your, that's your <laughs> list. This is my list. And in my list, I, I went into No Time to Die. It was the film that was the first film bumped before the pandemic. It was probably the first uh, film that I saw in the cinema after the, like after first, whatever lockdown it was, where I felt I'm back in the cinema. I truly, truly enjoyed the hell out of that film because it, uh, it felt like two Bond films rolled into one, but it kind of felt like it had all the good, the, the good elements of Bond films that I enjoyed. I love the audaciousness of actually finding finally closing out a an actor's tenure in the role as Bond in, for me, which was a satisfying way. And I enjoyed it. 
And I, the action scenes I thought were great. The individual set pieces. Yeah, Leah Sidhu and there's elements to the story that felt like maybe it could have been shortened. And, uh, uh, but every Bond film is a little, there's no such thing as an, a, a Bond film that is an amazing film. I don't think that exists, but there's great Bond films. And I don't think this is even the best of the great Bond films. But for me, definitely not. I am going on the cinematic experience I had while watching it. And I had the popcorn movie experience that made me fall in love with cinema in the beginning and I experienced it I went I came out of that film going that was that was that was joyful and fun and popcorny and spectacly and bondy and I'm so glad it, it was what it was plus I hadn't seen any trailers and what so I loved about it is that Daniel Craig looked like he was having a ball I agree the whole film <laughs> he looked so happy come on and it was really great <laughs> I, I, to see I, I him I want to hear your number five just like <laughs> before you pass my list get on to number five that's number five <laughs> My number five is probably one of the most polarizing films right now on release, and it's Don't Look Up. And I do not understand why everybody is having a shit fit about this film, because I thought it was a blast. It might be a little bit long. It's quite patchy in places. I do not particularly um, like the Ariana Grande subplot. Don't think you need it. Everything else, I thought it was just a fun as fuck film. And... I don't know what more you want. It's a comedy about the end of the world and it even got quite touching towards the end. And there's stuff that they do with the editing of this film, which I think is really daring and surprising. There are moments in it where I thought, hang on, they're jump cutting here and it's getting all fucked up. Something's gone wrong. My stream, did something happen with my stream here? It was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because they're cutting to moments where uh, characters are reacting, but they're still talking. Um, And it's right at the end when the world is sort of, you know, spoiler alert, getting destroyed. But I don't know. The left hate this film. The right hate this film. The people that are indifferent to this film hate this film. <laughs> uh, it's got Meryl Streep naked with a tramp stamp. What are you getting so bent out of shape for? It's really funny. There's a moment in it where they've discovered there's six months to the end of the world. And um, Jennifer Lawrence says to her boyfriend, who's trying to, he's pushing to have her have dinner with his mother. Yeah, can we have dinner in about seven months? And it's just the way that she says it, this offhanded sort of um, throwaway line that I have basically convinced you now is not funny at all, <laughs> but it made me cackle. Yeah. And I was cackling throughout the film. I thought it was great. It looks great. It's fun. It's Fuck off. It's good. I, 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 watched, I only watched it last <laughs> night. I only watched it last night and uh, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a, a, a fun satire. But you know what I really appreciate about it? Uh, Timothy Chalamet is in it. And I think he's fucking Oh, great. he's very good. He's great. He is. He's got real, like, like I was just I was watching his performance and it's a small role, but I went, this guy's a damn fine actor. Like, you know, what he does with his piece, he's, he has such a lovely moment at the end of the, uh, at the end of that film that he, he, he he's a Christian. He's this, he's say, uh, for me, he, elev- he saved, his character kind of saved the film a little bit for me, uh, where I found it. It was a little bit. Uh, shouty, but that's what it was supposed to be. It was the, the film felt like someone was shouting at me for, but I, I, I enjoyed it. I didn't think it was, I, I'm not personal. I didn't think it was bad or anything like that. It's on my long list. Um, shall I tell you my number five? Do because I'm sort of getting fucked up here because my list seems to be missing one though. So I sort of have gone wrong somewhere. You can some sneak one on because we jumped around. You can sneak one on, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, but we're getting towards the top tier now, and I, you might <laughs> I be- don't have any. I don't know. I can't have, I can't pull one from the bottom of the deck. And pull <laughs> one from it up. <laughs> we'll just assume that. No, I'm pretty sure. But and we might have had an overlap. So, oh, you might, we, we've got uh, Red Rocket to discuss because that's something we are, we had coming up in common. My number mm-hmm. five is uh, The French Dispatch, the Wes Anderson film that was also the lake that got released. And um, very good. It's a, the most, one of the most Wes Anderson, Wes Anderson type films I've ever seen. Um, it's a, <laughs> like, it's, it's super deluxe Wes Anderson. Super deluxe Wes Anderson. Really really hyper-stylized. But you know what? That's what I love about Wes Anderson stories. But he always has this, like, he just... His films are like watching clockwork, uh, like clockwork uh, puppets and and uh, uh, dioramas. They're working. a confection. They're confections. It's like watching an animated movie, only with real life characters mm. and all done with all with the effects in camera. So it's like watching a, a magic show uh, and a, a performance happening in front Dude. of your eyes. I love it. There are so many, this, this film is, it's a, it's an anthology film for one thing. And um, a, a lot of it is done in montage 
And when you think of the cutaways that are done, where they, they're summing up the city and are, <laughs> pickpocket alley, and it it's got like twenty or thirty extras. It's dressed all the way back to the to like the deep focus, <laughs> and there's an old lady that's standing to the side next to all these punks as one of the pickpockets. Yeah. It's like that all the way through where you think, how much money did they spend just for that one cutaway <laughs> shot designing those sets? It, it's wall to it. You'd be, yeah, it's supercharged Wes Anderson. It's in my honourable mentions list. Um, there's a there's a moment, a sequence in it that I thought was just so funny and you couldn't pull it off in any other film except a Wes Anderson film in which there is a dramatic car chase or even more a, a plane chase and I assumed that what happened was it was just too expensive to shoot so they just cut away to an animated version of they just did an, that at sequence in animation <laughs> in actual hand-drawn animation and because it's so hyper stylized you totally just accept that yep yeah, that's what's happening in this film and because the rest of the film's aesthetic kind of looks like it but it is just a joyful confection and uh, I highly recommend the it. The reason the reason it wasn't on my top 10 list is because I did find jumping around so much to, to be, it kept me at a distance and I was getting a bit exhausted towards the end. I thought the first story was the most compelling. Um, but uh, you, listen, we're splitting hairs here. I love every single Wes Anderson movie, even the, the really insufferable ones. And I know he's like Marmite for a lot of people. This is a great film to watch. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, definitely recommend it. So Kevin, that was my number five. What's your number four? What's your next one, basically? My num- my number four is going to have to be one I'm going to pull from my honourable mentions list Go on. because um, I have got a gap here, and it's going to be the the dig, and the oh. the, <laughs> the dig. Yeah, I'm I'm going to start stuttering here now. Mm-hmm. It was written by Moira Buffini, and it stars Carrie Mulligan. It came out in February, <clears throat> or that's when I saw it, mm-hmm. and it is about a lady of a manor. She's inherited this house uh, as a widow and Ralph Fiennes is the groundskeeper and on the land they discover an archaeological site of extreme importance. Um, uh, is it a Viking ship? It's a, it's a Viking it's an old, ship. Yeah, it's a Viking ship, yeah. It's a Viking ship. Yes. Yeah. And um, <laughs> Todd, you wouldn't hear that. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it's beautifully it understated and... Um, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's on my long what list. What can I say? It's on my long list. We're really it was on pleasant. my long list as well, yeah. but I f- fucked up somewhere. So now it's my I bet four. you what will happen is anyway. we'll overlap and you'll find you're missing one. My number four is a uh, film that's on Netflix, just came out. I think it's going to be a big Oscar contender. The Power of the Dog, Jane Campion's film starring... Uh, yeah, that was my number seven, I think, or number oh, eight. Oh, so now we can talk about it. Okay, so um, starring Benedict Cumberbatch, Cumberbatch, isn't that how you pronounce it? Kristen Dunst, Jesse Plemons, uh, mm-hmm. and Jane Campion. She wrote it along with Thomas Savage. It's uh, really... Com- oh, it's based on his book. Oh, okay. really. oh, sorry, I didn't know that, but a really compelling yep. story. Uh, almost, It's kind of hard to describe what genre it is because it's set on a ranch in 1920s, I believe it is. And there's mm-hmm. two brothers who live in this ranch. Um, kind of be- uh, Benedict Cumberbatch is kind of this rugged, dirty, very uh, intelligent uh, uh, ranch hand who runs the place. And then his other brother, Jesse Plemons, Plemons is... He's a bastard. The Batch is a complete bastard. <laughs> he is. He's a manipulative, yeah. terrifying, incredible bully. I... Th- I thought he was miscast when the film started. I thought, oh, when it geez, started, this doesn't work at all. Okay, it does And then when it started to slowly reveal itself, or his yes. character started to see more sides to him, I thought, oh yeah, okay, he's perfectly cast. Yeah. For me, this felt like a film from the early two thousands when we had perfected movies, prestige, sort of studio films, and it was all down to the quality of the script and the execution. And the ending is what assured it would be on my top ten list. Because uh, it's such a gleeful, devilish ending. Yeah, and how it's shot. Yeah, how it's I, shot. I want to. I want to call out. It is gorgeous. It's, uh, it was cinematographer was Ari uh, New Zealand Ari, baby uh, Wagner. It is stunning looking film. It is beautifully shot. It's got great tension. Uh, it's. I. I really, really thought this was a gripping. Uh, thrill. Not. I wouldn't say it's a thrilling story, but it's gripping. You. You can feel your knuckles digging into the arms of the, your, your armchair as you're watching it because the tension keeps turning and tightening um, as uh, things unfold. Also, I just want to give a shout out to Kirsten Dunst, who is fantastic in it. She is giving a a great performance of someone who is quite brittle. 
mm-hmm. um, which she does very well usually. But she is an actress that I think has been fantastic now for the entirety of her career, which is almost 30 years. We're going back now to the 90s. With yeah. her. Um, she's always an MVP. And again, in this film, she's just so eminently watchable and likable. Mm-hmm. And she plays drunk uh, better than most actors do that have won awards doing it. Um, she's an excellent actress and she really needs to get her laurels at this stage. I do. I agree so, with you. Um, and I'm shocked that Jesse Plemons, the, the Jesse Plemons, who I first saw on the TV series Friday Night Lights, who was not the handsome leads. There was like two other male leads in that series who are the obvious, like, you know, Hollywood future stars. And it's Jesse Plemons is the guy who has been the Hollywood A-lister and he's fantastic as well. He's not a handsome I guy. I saw but him first in Breaking Bad and I remember he got, um, he, he got dragged by the scumbags on Twitter who kept calling him Fat Damon. And, oh, wow. uh, and now look at him. Yeah. He's up there with Philip Seymour Hoffman. And I think that if he keeps going, he's he's going to cement himself being in that same category of, of yeah. great character actors. Yeah. He's so likable. Yeah. Okay. That was my number four. So what's your next one, which I hope is number three? My number three is Red Rocket. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. That was my number eight. So let's talk about Red Rocket. Tell me, why is it your number three? It is the third film by Sean Baker. It's written by Chris Burgock with Sean Baker. It is a comedy starring Simon Rex, who is an ex-porn star who goes back to his hometown to basically um, charm his way into finagling a place to stay and a way to get back on his feet from his ex-wife. And it is so funny. And Simon Rex, I wasn't particularly aware of his career other than him being a standout in one of the scary movies. Uh, I think it was Scary Movie 3 or Scary Movie 4. He was hilarious in that. He is brilliant in this. And um, the film shot in 60 millimeter, so it's a bit harsh on the eyes. And I know they use mm. uh, anamorphic lenses as well, so it sort of dampens it down even more. But it's just a great story of a scumbag trying to get back on his feet. Mm-hmm. He's so likable that you're rooting for him, even though you think you sh- sniveling shit. But there's a moment in in the film, which was my biggest laugh of 2021 of all the films I've seen, where I busted up laughing and I had to pause the film to basically just enjoy the laugh and then catch up. And it is where he has slightly fallen on good times. He's got a lot of money coming in and he is pitching what he's going to be doing to his <laughs> to his neighbour that lives next door, who's a, sort of a stoner. Mm-hmm. And he's telling him about all his big plans. And he tells him to take a right. It's right here. Right, 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 right. And the guy does a right and a truck don't, blares its horn. Yeah, don't spoil it. Don't spoil it. <laughs> I can't spoil it. But the cutaway that comes after that. Yeah, I have loved all of Sean Baker's films, but this is my favourite Sean Baker film because it was so entertaining. And it's my number three. Oh man, it's it's in my top 10, right? But we had two totally different experiences with that film. I didn't find it funny at all. I found it oppressive. Really? Yeah. I found it oppressive, fr- uh, frustrating. I didn't find him, char- Mikey Saber, charming at all. I found him to be an, what? Ex- an exploiter, a user. I had a, like, you know, I had him pinned from the, f- from the very first scene. And I, I just went, this, I wanted, I, wa- I, I hated him. I hated him the whole way through, but I didn't, I didn't, not that I disliked the character. I thought it was a fantastic performance. I thought it was an amazing character. I thought oh it was an God, amazing that's film. so fascinating. But so my, my experience with the film was I felt the oppression. I felt that film closing in around me. I wanted everyone to just run from him, to get him out of their lives. I was screaming. I, mm. I felt myself screaming. He's fucking using you. This fucker is using <laughs> you. And he's, he's, he's such a dumbass. He's, he, but he, what he's, what he's good at is he's good at, he's good at exploiting people, but he's not clever enough to think three steps ahead or two weeks ahead. He only has like foresight. He only has the, 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 the foresight of a, I don't know, a goldfish, you know? Um, and yes, that scene you're talking about that you said was, that you thought was hilarious to cut away. I was having the exact opposite experience. I was devastated in that. In oh my one, God. Yeah, I Jesus was devastated Christ. because I was thinking about the other kid. And I was going, oh God, what have you done? What have you done? I was kind of like- He took responsibility. That's what he did. And it sort of showed you the comparison between that guy and this guy. Oh my God. It, to me, this is a comedy. Oh, it's not a comedy to me, man. It's a, it's a, to me, it's a, 
It's a, a bleak portrait of um, Middle America and what's happened there, and uh, you know how, how. Well, that is definitely true. How that is, it's a very depressing, dilapidated part of yeah. America, and you realise that the American dream is a bit of a myth for feels, an awful lot of the population. It feels like you're in the whirlpool being sucked down. That's what it feels like. That and he's he's desperately trying to swim against the the, the pull, you know, down the down the drain. That's what it felt like to me. I just wanted I wanted the film to end, but I thought it was a really great film and it's in my top 10 list and I really I highly recommend it, but I would not say that this is one of the funniest films of the year. I would say <laughs> No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it gave me my biggest laugh oh, of the year. I, okay, There's fair enough. Moment yeah, I would. I would give. Well, I would. I would err to listeners to say, right? Don't expect this to be a barrel of laughs. It's not a barrel of laughs. Definitely wasn't for me. But a great film. Yeah, I. I didn't mean to. Um, to to suggest that, but it's here on Wikipedia as American comedy drama films. So yeah, dra- I would say drama so, more drama than comedy. I was. Yeah, there's definitely funny elements to it. There's take definitely it funny. up with the internet. Will the yeah, internet is always that's right. Fine. That's fine. <laughs> but but I'm so glad with some border list, and I think it definitely deserves to be on border list. Absolutely. So what's your number three, Will? My number three almost there is uh, Licorice Pizza, the new Paul Thomas Anderson film. Um, I uh, haven't seen it. Yeah, I'm so it. jealous. It's because I'm sure I, it, it would make my top ten. Listen, it's oh, it's hard to describe. I is it. Paul Thomas Anderson's greatest film? I don't think so. Um, but is it his most personal film? I think it is. It feels very intimate. It feels very personal. It feels very messy. Like it it doesn't... But that's a kind of... All the messiness is the reason I kind of like this film. And I didn't know what the film was about. All I knew was, it was that it was set in the 1970s in the San Fernando Valley, San Fernando Valley in California, and it follows a high, stu- high school student who uh, he's a successful child actor, and he meets the woman of his dreams, and he says, "I'm going to marry that woman someday." So it's a boy meets girl type of story, okay? And it's but it's set in this kind of like uh, around the period of the the fuel, the oil crisis, and the, when there was a lack of petrol and petrol, you know, in, in America and stuff like that, and it's this kind of breezy, whimsical. Uh, drifting type of narrative through the life of these young people in California and at that time and place. Do you endorse the relationships of this film, Will? Uh, I endorse <laughs> nothing, Kevin. I endorse absolutely nothing. Um, but all I'll say is, look, the the the, the people, the, the the actors in this, uh, Alana Alana Haim is the is the girl, and it's actually Philip Seymour Philip Seymour Hoffman's son, Cooper Hoffman, is the is the is the main kid in this, and he's fantastic. They're both fantastic, and you want to know what this film has, Kevin? Something that we've said a lot over our podcast. Interesting it's got, faces. It's got faces. It's got teenagers <laughs> with pimples. It's got people with pe- people actors oh, with yeah. crooked teeth. Love it. It's got like you know what I mean. It it and when you see like uh, air hostesses, they're not air hostesses circa twenty twenty where we're all like you know they're you not know, like Britney Spears. Britney Spears. Toxic- These are air hostesses and they just have a bit of blusher on their cheeks and they're not looking. They it feels like you're in a time. It feels like you're watching a film from the early nineteen seventies, not watching a film from twenty you know twenty twenty one. And all I'll say is that this film took me on. It transported me back to a time and place that um, uh, I was so glad I kind of had that journey with these characters. And and yes, it's messy. It's long, as a lot of these films are. And I want to make sure about the, who, who yeah, it was written by Paul Thomas Anderson as well. But it's, um, I think you'll really enjoy it, Kevin. I think you really okay. will. I think he so shot too. on film as well. I do like well. his films. So it has this grainy, you know the way we're talking about films now, kind of having that, mm. you know, DV quality. This is def- was definitely shot on film because it looks like it was shot on film. So um, just for that alone, I loved it and I thought it was great performances and I thought, I didn't know anything. So don't look up anything about the plot because I what I assumed it was do we it find out, out uh, do we find out what licorice tastes like on pizza no <laughs> I ended up I, <laughs> but this is the one thing I will say at the end of the film I went why is that film called licorice pizza I have no idea isn't I still it because, didn't know isn't, uh, isn't it because isn't there a record store that's called licorice pizza and licorice pizza is sort of what a, a vinyl record looks like really licorice pizza 
Oh, yeah. okay. That's well. There you go. You've. Uh, I still don't know how that's. Uh, that's just know, my interpretation. I may be wrong on that. Maybe. But, you know. Maybe that's so. But I don't. Still, even after getting that information, I don't know how it connects to the film. But it is my number three <laughs> from this year. I. It was a film film. You know, it was a film film, Kelvin. It was a film that I just went, I've watched, just A watched. film film. It was it a was proper a film. film. Yeah, it was one that I just felt like I watched <clears throat> something. And so that was my number three. So what's your number two, Kevin? My number two is Palm Springs. Oh, good call. Written by Andy Ciara and directed by Max Barbaco. Uh, it came out in the States in 2020, I believe. It didn't come out here until around April 2021. I saw it in 2020. I loved it. Um, I loved it so much that I dragged it into the 2021 pile. It is the most entertaining, uh, probably, film uh, on my list. It's so clever. I have written a recursive timeline, time loop type script. I know how hard they are to do um, and how fantastically well this one pulls it off. Uh, it's Andy Sandberg who is in Palm Springs for a wedding and he gets caught in a Groundhog Day type time loop where he keeps waking up and reliving the same day over and over again until he drags a girl that he's hitting on at the a wedding into his loop and they're both trapped reliving the same day over and over again together. It's so funny and it's so surprising and it really is just an utter blast. It's such a cracking film. Mm-hmm. I truly, I, I really love that film. Uh, an original take on that time loop thing. And uh, yeah, if you haven't seen Pam Strings, like, you know, definitely, definitely watch that one. It's great. So glad you, I didn't have that on my list anywhere. I don't know why, Kevin. Um, <laughs> What's your number two? My number two is The Green Knight, the uh, David Lowry film, which he wrote and directed. Uh, the kind of like- That's my number one. Is it? No, it's not. Oh, no, right. It's, okay. not. <laughs> it's so probably my number 15, I think. Oh, say. it's okay. It's in your long list. So it's yes. basically a kind of a a play on the kind of the King Arthur legend, a very loose play on a, that old epic poem and starring, starring Deb Patel, Lisa Vikander. And uh, it's on Amazon Prime. It is an epic fantasy adventure that is kind of doing things at its own pace and its own vibe. And it's very composed and it's very deliberate and I really love the movie. Quite oblique, and, I would say. Yeah, I but I felt it was controlled. I felt it it commands a sense of tone throughout the film where I where where I felt like it was in I was in the hands of a competent filmmaker. Uh, who was who was leading me down uh, you know, uh, you know on, on a tail that's you know that and scratching an itch that I kinda hadn't has scratched since Excalibur. It's a sumptuous film. It looks incredible. Uh, it felt like a dream, mm-hmm. but in the end, I just thought, okay. <laughs> Are you, you you weren't connected. To it. I felt like no, I was I taken on it. Wasn't connected. I thought Dev Patel was incredible, and he yeah. has really shown himself to have great range. Like he comes off like a, like a a don in this. I have a real difficulty connecting to David uh, Lowry's films. I find him very austere and cold you see i i feel it's for me it's about it's a, it is about tone and it is about creating a, a world of mystery a world of fantasy and fa- the, for me the best fantasy has a lot of mystery and leaves a lot of uh, question marks for the viewer to fill in and I, I like those spaces between dialogue i like that space for you for the audience to to think mm. and to ruminate and to meditate kind of on this experience and kind of chew on, okay, what's this fable about? What's And I think that's what the best fables do is they, they leave yeah. us questioning what, what we've actually experienced. And I think this film does leave you uh, thinking about what, what the moral of the story is and, uh, you, know, you know, what the game ultimately is. So yeah, that's my number two anyway, Kevin. I thought it was a lush film, a lovely film. And um I'd recommend it to people who like that type of slow paced fantasy thing, kind of like Excalibur. And it was, I think Willow was was an influence on this as well. Uh, Ultimately that leads us to our number one pick. And And my number one pick was Halloween Kills. Really? No, it's not. Oh, will you stop throwing these? (laughs) Oh, fake. Okay, this is the fourth. Listen. No wonder you couldn't keep track of what your top 10 list was. You keep putting in fake films in your top 10 list. That's the reason. Mm, 
I really but, liked Halloween Kills, but I couldn't add it to the list because I know that I would just get shit off people. But I will okay. say that horror films do get a very bad, rough time of it by critics on release. And then down the line, they're reappraised and they're considered in a new light. It's happened going as far back as Psycho, which was mauled by critics and is now considered to be a masterpiece. And on mm. and on and on and on throughout the the decades with horror films and Halloween Kills is a lot better than people think it is. Will it get reappraised to the point where it's regarded as, as a great film? I don't know, but it's a great Halloween film I and mean. it was my most anticipated film of the year and I really enjoyed it, but it's not on my list because I'm afraid that all of you guys will hate me and uh-huh. I think I'm an idiot. <laughs> my number one of yes. the year is The Last Jewel. Oh, wow. That's a shock. Wow. Amazing. So tell really? me what? No, no. Listen, I really like the last year, but I want to know why. Tell me, I'm excited. I'm delighted. I'm delighted. Ridley Scott, number one in Kevin's top, top of Kevin's list. Tell me why, Kevin. Why is the last year up there for you? Because what else? What else takes you on such a, a, a refreshing journey as this one? I mean, it is a little bit like Rashomon, but it really gets deep into it and it tells you a, a story from the perspective of three main players: Matt Damon. Uh, Adam Driver and Jodie Comer Mm -hmm. and I didn't know where it was going I had a real difficult time with it in the beginning I thought this film feels like I'm seeing the um, the uh, Cliff Notes version of it It, it's just jumping all over the place I don't know what's happening then I realised that this is the story as told from the point of view of the Matt Damon character so his view of himself is how the, the story is choosing to to represent him so the dialogue is different the the interactions are different cut to adam driver it comes alive ben affleck is is great in it then you get to the jodie comer uh scene and you get to see what is the truth and i had no idea where this film was going and it is the most rewarding film i think i've seen this year it just i i can't say any more than it's a big blockbuster that deserved uh, more eyes on it than it has gotten. And it's my favourite film when I weighed them all up uh, of the year. So I just thought it was a cracking story. Written by, for the first time, separate writers writing different parts. So Nicole Hall of Centre wrote all of Jodie Comer's point of view. Mm -hmm. And Matt Damon and Ben Affleck wrote Adam Driver's and Matt Damon's point of view. And I think it pays off. It's... It's a great, great movie. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you're bringing it up because it was for me, the Jodie Comer section was a section that I, the film clicked for me and I felt, oh, okay. I really started to appreciate everything that had gone before it and the stakes in her section really amped up and I just, I felt- But it made everything that came before better. Yes, that's exactly it. It made everything. And what I found fascinating about the film was how, in each version of the of the telling of their individual stories, they all every character painted themselves as the victim of their of their narrative. Yes, even though the facts of the narrative didn't change at all, the facts actually ch- were pretty much consistent throughout. It was just the lens through which you see the the the, the story being told changed, and that altered our perception of it. And and Jodie Comer's one is the one that was closest to the truth, and because she was the true and only victim. In, in in this narrative and you see... Yeah, the Inquisition, the, the sort of the trial, it, it yeah. plays like an Inquisition, but the trial where you hear them saying, you know, a baby cannot be born through rape because oh, a woman God. needs to enjoy sex in oh, order to conceive. Yeah. Deli- and that the, is science. Are this, you denying science? I was like, oh my God, how, how did women survive to this? How did humanity survive to this point when we were brutalizing women so much? Did you but experience anyway. the little death? I, that's, that was... Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, my, so you're I'm really, so curious. Oh, so yeah. it's obvious. I yeah, I think it is obvious now. When I when I think about there it, there you go. It's, go on. Tell Yours me. wasn't obvious. My number one for the year uh, is Dune, and it had to have been Dune. It was my most anticipated film of the year, and and I genuinely felt there is no way they can kind of live up to the hype I had in my head because I'm a huge fan of Denis Villeneuve, and uh, I think, don't think he's put a foot wrong in his career so far. But if I you're felt- such a big fan of Denis Villeneuve, name five of his biggest albums. 
<laughs> well, for me, uh, Dune adapted from Frank Herbert's novel um, by Eric Roth and John Space, uh, I think, and John Denny Villeneuve as well. But I think they actually worked pretty close in collaboration together. It's It was uh, an unusual kind of adaptation. But um, yeah, I feel for me, again, kind of like No Time to Die. When I watched that film in the cinema, it gave me the tingles of of the experience of watching a big blockbuster film in the cinema, but it felt like it was for the nerdy sci-fi grown-up that I am. And it scratched the itch. It was, it was sumptuous. It looked beautiful. It managed to tell a version of the story, which was way too unwieldy in the David Lynch version, uh, but it managed to tell that story in a very satisfying manner. I was very nervous about the film being split, the story being split in two, because I felt, oh God, are you, are we going to have a very unsatisfying conclusion to this where we feel, oh, we'll come back next time, like a Lord of the Rings uh, episode one or whatever it was, the Fellowship um, episode. But Ultimately, I felt they told a compelling uh, first part to this, hopefully will be a two-part film. And I felt very, very satisfied. I would have easily sat on for another two to three hours and watched the next part. I was Listen, I loved it as well. And I am sort of confused as to why it's not on my list. I think I included it. And then I just kept adding new films and I bumped it somewhere. That's okay. This should be in my top 10. I really had a blast with this film and I forgot all about it until we were halfway through talking about uh films this year but what more can you can you it it succeeded where i thought it was going to fall on its face i'm trying to think who would enjoy this film this is what i'm trying to think like do i think the regular let's say the kind of like someone who's into sci-fi would enjoy this film or you know i I think the this is going to be the guys in their early 20s who come in by themselves and uh they they're They'd rent Fight Club, but they'd also rent Lara Croft. Uh, that crowd. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it's not going to be the guys that come in looking for the latest Al Chapino film. Um, <laughs> and it's not going to be, you know, the couples. You're not going to rent it to the to the guy coming in who's ripping out his wallet and paying for whatever she wants to watch. I don't think it has a universal appeal of like a Lord of the Rings where you kind of got, you, you, it, once you actually got swept away in that film, it was like, it was pleasing to everyone because it's not a bar of laughs. It's just, uh, but it is what it is. It feels like a beautifully execute, executed science fiction story and uh, with amazing performances. And I really, really enjoyed it. It made me feel uh, reconnected with cinema again after a very long 18 months. So yeah, that was my number one. There you go. Any other um, honourable mentions from you? Uh, oh yeah. Well, I my, I could have interchanged like the top 15. Um, some of the, go- some of the gods and animated movie that was kind of a, based on a manga, I thought was great. The, the, um, the Spencer movie with, um, uh, All right. Kirsten, uh, Kirsten Stewart, the one by Pablo Lorraine about Diana Spencer. That was really good. The Eyes of Tammy Faye, uh, Jessica Chastain. Yeah, I'd love to see that. It's very good uh, with Andrew Garfield. And actually, yeah, I really liked Andrew Garfield in it. Really well cast in this one. I thought he was very good mm. in it. Uh, the Mitchells versus the Machines, a great animated movie. Uh, Nobody, that's um, action yes, movie. Yes, that's one of mine. Great fun. Very fun, slight, very slight. It's more of a director's film than a writer's film. So that's how I bumped it. That was yeah. my justification for it. But it's good. It was good. It, did, it knew what it was and it executed it quite well. What about you? Do you have any kind of like honourable mentions on your long list? No, I think I mentioned them all. The only one I would say um, that I enjoyed, but it's quite heavy, was Flea, which is the animated oh, sort yeah. of... Um, uh, it's an animated documentary, documentary, I suppose. Yeah, it's an animated yeah. documentary, yeah about uh, an immigrant who flees Afghanistan with his family to um, Moscow and tries to make his way to Denmark. And it's quite harrowing, but the animation is so beautiful that you end up sort of having this disconnect between the tension of the the story they're telling, you know, the the, the misery with this lovely animation style. So I, I quite like that. It's on the long list. So if they didn't come up in this list, I've probably seen them. The only big ones I haven't seen is West Side Story, Licorice Pizza, The Worst Person in the World, and um, Drive My Car, because it was three hours long and I just couldn't I couldn't commit that time to it. So I'll see it at some stage, but I didn't get to see it over Christmas. There's a bunch as well for me that I haven't yet to see, like King Richard, the Will Smith one, um, The Last Daughter, Olivia Coleman. Uh, yeah, film. yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's a bunch still. So this is not by far a definitive list of these are the best films that came out in 2021. Um, not, a, not at all. Uh, these are just the my favourite that I've seen so far. 
But listen, to all our Patreon backers, thank you for helping us to make the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to everyone on the main feed, uh, thank you for sticking with us. We're on hiatus at the moment. We'll be back in the spring. We've got another lot of cracking episodes to come. We've got T2 with Dan Martin uh, on Patreon next week. Then we have uh, we have ET with Joe Barton on the main feed. We have The Lost World on the main feed, which with our friend Dave Minogue, uh, which is the funniest commentary I think we've done. Oh, geez, I, actually, that was great, Craig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> three lads talking about <laughs> characters being eaten by dinosaurs. Yeah. I think we lost it. It was very um, and we have Stone Cold where we do a watch along for the first time on Patreon which is something new and if you guys like it we'll do more of them and we've got Tremors coming and stuff like that so there's, there's more to come but we also have some big things planned for next year but we won't spoil that right now why spoil um, it yeah why spoil it yeah. not even so listen happy new year everyone hope Absolutely. you have a great 2022 and I hope that you will include us in that and thank you so much for listening to us throughout 2021 it's been an absolute joy absolutely hope you uh, have a fun time breaking those resolutions by the end of January Um, and (laughs) yeah uh, chat to you soon And here is a clip from the lads' latest Mini Bits bonus show. The full episode, plus 80 more, are available on their Patreon. See ya, Mossy. I gotta go in and record another one of these fucking Mini Bits. Oh, yes, it's such a little I know. <sighs> what are you doing? I, right now, on the Academy screener site, and I hit play because there's only a few films on it for the first month or two. There's only like about less than 10 films on it. And Guy Ritchie's The Covenant is on here. So I hit play on that. And I'm hearing all the, we're out in Afghanistan and I'm hearing all the dirt and I hear vehicles and I hear the sound effects of characters walking. But when characters open their mouths, I don't hear any dialogue. Mm-hmm. Oh, they've up- no dialogue. They've uploaded the wrong audio track. It's like that Tom Cruise yeah. trailer where it was just a sound effect. Like, have you met an SP? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this film has been up on the screen site for a few weeks now, and they still have the wrong one here. Well, I tell you what films are actually up there for all Academy members to see, and they see what they've put up Do, there. but first of all, let's just throw to our theme. And I have to say... The feedback from my thank you ballad thank you. was quite fierce. The power of Christ compels you. So I asked Mossy, who is a friend of my dad's at the quiz, sing us a theme tune. Oh. So over to Mossy. <laughs> Hit the cards. I'm fine. I'll get it done from one day. It's the many bits. Oh my gosh, what will they say? With Will and Kevin Cock. The best fucking podcast. That'll do. <laughs> That'll do. My God. Thank you, Mossy. He would make an angel weep. That voice would make an angel weep. Telling you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Boolabus. It only cost us two months' patron money, so, you know. Is that all? Money well spent, in my eyes. Yeah. I mean, you can't get much for 20 euro. <laughs> Will, you were telling me before uh, the intro that you uh, were looking at stuff on the Academy Screeners website. The Academy Awards. So for official members, yes. So how we, they don't send out DVDs anymore. So how you do all your streaming stuff is all via the Academy website. And the streaming season has begun, which is exciting. So it means for the rest of the year. I'm Did it be- ever end? Uh, it does end. It does after the Academy Awards. There's about two weeks, and they <laughs> take all the films down, and then they begin again at the end of August, and they all start coming up. So it's a whole new collection of hopefuls. So how many films are on there right now? About ten, actually ten exactly. I can tell you the ten. Oh, um, go on, tell me. John Wick four for the Oscars. Oh, because there's like yes, there's... they're adding in stunt category, aren't they? Are they adding it in? It's a stunt category being added. I believe they're adding in some sort of stunt category. 
breaking news straight from an Academy member's mouth. Because they're adding in stunt category, aren't they? Slash film. I don't know. Did I see read this in an article? I feel they were. They. I felt they were. Have long overlooked stunts, and my God, it's pure artistry. Yeah, and it is incredibly well these days. It's all fucking rubber computer generated. Avatars. That's why we should hide. That's why pe- these people should be getting their Oscars when, yeah. back when someone's actually gone out then. Yeah, go back, back to, absolutely. Go back and back give it to your man from Mad Max who broke his legs. And uh, give it to Richard Farnsworth, who uh, was a stuntman and was uh, starred in The Straight Story. Yeah, Richard Farnsworth is, was a career stuntman. Oh. Absolutely. Wasn't that also mm-hmm. the case with um, uh, Machete? What's your man, Machete? Danny Trejo. Danny Trejo. Is really? It Trejo or Trejo? I always call him Trejo, but he just says, call me Danny. <laughs> I was going to say that back to you. Nah. Like, just, uh, <laughs> we were. Just call me Danny.